After your residency in Hafnerborg, I noticed that your work is considerably more confident. Your gestures are far more present. You can see there's emotion in your work. Why is that? Was there something that happened specifically in Iceland that made this change? How did you find Iceland? The first trip to Iceland mm. in 20, 20, 2019, um, I just got a little t sort of taste of the place. I absolutely loved it. It was just this incredible um, monochromatic palette that I loved. And you know, when, when I returned, I applied then to um, to go back to the Hamburg Arts and Culture Centre, and I was lucky enough to get given a residency. And I knew that there was something that I really needed to pursue in the space. And um, I think it was just being able to be in an environment that is seen by so few people. Really, I know tourism is on the increase in Iceland, but. You know, we managed to hire a car and we, we, we sort of went off track a bit and we ended up in the most phenomenal landscapes. And I think it taught me to be a little bit more, well, it taught me to be braver with my work really, just sort of being there and experiencing things that are so big, powerful, massive, stripped back even, um, taught me to be the same with my work. So my work now, is more confident, I think, and I'm trying to distill my marks into something that's as pure as the landscape that I saw when I was there. Thinking about that moment where you were in Iceland and witnessed the power of nature and how unpredictable it was and how small you were in relation to that, is that what has caused this new confidence in your work? This, these large gestures, these strong marks, is that, do you, would you say that that's the reasoning behind this new confidence? Um, I think there's two things. I think witnessing the landscape obviously has been fundamental to the changes and, and you know, my work's been very well received since I've got back because I think I, I am more confident about my work. I feel that I've hit the floor running and I do feel that I've found my language now and that I'm able to paint and um, get across my ideas in quite a sort of, not a simple way, that's not the right way, but a more distilled way. Mm. And then the other thing was um, I went through quite a serious health scare about two or three years ago and um, you know I, it sort of puts everything into perspective when you actually realise that life is finite mm -hmm. you know, it's, and you do only have a certain amount of time and since having had that sort of scare and then moving to Iceland I've realised that I've got a lot of painting in me and I really do need to get it out and I'm working probably the hardest I've ever worked on my work. And, um, with that and with the reactions that I'm getting from people and, and the way that it makes me feel, I feel that the for, the, probably for the first time I'm connecting on a very emotional level, um, which I've always done, but it just feels true and honest at the moment. I'm interested in your titles. Um, I think that they're quite a core cool part of your work, but I know that you don't really like talking about your work very much, so there's this interesting kind of polarity there. All of your titles, and um, every time you discuss your work in writing, you capitalise these kind of like large themes. You've got nature capitalised, death capitalised, which can be quite jarring to someone who doesn't really understand why you're doing that. Can you talk a little bit about why you choose to capitalise these words, these large human elements or these large kind of big themes? It sort of started from when I was able to read and write, probably about four or five. I've always thought that really important words should have a capital letter. We were taught that pronouns should have a capital letter. And to me, you know, nature, um, has to have a capital letter purely for that reason in the same way that beauty or the sublime or um, death, like you say, um, I capitalise because they're almost words that I can't fathom. Are you trying to get something across to the people that are experiencing your work? Is there an important element of um, transference of ideas there or you, is it more visceral human? Yeah, it's more about the emotional connection that you have to the paintings. But I want people to be able to walk into a space and to be able to stand in front of my work and yeah, they can appreciate the surface quality, they can appreciate the, the, how the paint's been on, but it's more about what's happening in the space between the painter and the eyes that are actually looking at the painting. And it's that sort of energy and that, that sort of... Um, that, it's like when you, talk, when you talk about science and you think about the atom and then you break the atom down to particles and then you break the particles down to nano particles and then they go down to string theory and all of these things, these sort of physical things. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the metaphysical, the things that actually hold those things together, that sort of energy between those two things. Talking about scale, 
your work has expanded in size recently. Yeah. Yeah. You used to work, you, you did um, formerly work on landscapes in different tones and at times they were of a similar size, but the combination of, for example, these dark, dark, dark ones on the, to the left of you right now, there's the scale and there's the graphic element, they're very present, they're very bold. Yeah. Is that was that a conscious decision for you in terms of creating this visceral reaction within your viewers, this combination of large scale paintings and also tone? Are you trying to just be a presence in a room with these paintings? Yeah, I think so. I think I, I, I got to a point where working on a metre square wasn't enough. You know, I, I needed to be able to sort of have to really push myself physically to be able to move the work around. And I think it had, they had to start to become much bigger than me because the subject matter and the ideas that were having were ideas that were much bigger than myself, so it just seemed very strange to sort of make work that was quite small. Um, you know, I, I also like to work in series, I mean there's four pieces here, a certain slant of winter light. Um, I've got quite a big studio space, I'm very fortunate, so I can make quite large work, but you know, I'm not as strong as I used to be, and actually physically moving something that would be eight metres by two metres, I wouldn't be able to do that by myself. And also, the way that I actually make the work relies very much on um, gravity and moving things around, tipping them up, tipping them over, and I wouldn't physically be able to do that, which is why I do like to work in multiples for that very reason. Mm -hmm. And I think these, although they are individual pieces, you could almost push them together and they would be this one vast piece of work. So scale, scale is at the moment something that I'm sort of trying to sort of push a bit, and I'm hoping um, as the weather gets better that I want to sort of start working on really big pieces of canvas. They probably will never be stretched, I imagine them sort of hanging things more like sort of tapestries or stuff like that. Your manipulation of gravity within your work, there's a lot of drips, there's a lot of dense oil being mixed and there's a flow and a movement there. Is that something that you're trying to channel with this work in relation to the subjects that you're covering? So large scale spaces it is. Yeah, I think so. I think using pattern is a way for me, personally, to um, create some kind of structure within the work. And as soon as I start thinking, that's too structured, that's mm -hmm. driving me a little bit mad, I don't like the way that that's too formulaic and too rigid, that's when I'll start throwing paint on the, on the surface of the paintings, that's when I tip them up and drag them down. And I like this idea of the fact that it could, it could almost be like a life, um, a birth, a life and a death within the work, because you're born, everything is very structured, it's rigid, and then you know things happen and gravity takes takes hold of us peop as people and we all just get pushed down and down down, we end up back in the ground again and there's this whole cyclical nature of, um, of life and I'm trying to sort of get that across in my work. I I'm not sure if that makes sense. No, no, it did make sense, but it made me think of this um, quote from Alan Watts, who's a philosopher that some people are very against and some people are very pro, but that I really like this quote and it says that um, whenever human beings have been around we see rectangles as straight lines because we're always trying to straighten things out. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think looking at your work there's this push and pull with that idea of order and disorder at play at once um, and I think that that's really come into motion with this series and this exhibition right now because you're working within the premises of squares and rectangles, yeah. you're working on these rigid canvases yeah. and yet the work themselves, there is a disorder there and it, there's an unpredictability there. I quite like that balance though. I do, I mean on these white paintings in particular, I've deliberately put the white edge, square edge on, mm. to sort of try to contain the, the sort of, the, the amount of work that's happened on, with the paint. Mm. Um, I, what I do like about the paint, with oil paint as well, is the fact that I can throw oil, uh, you know, like a turpentine diluted oil down on the surface at five o'clock and I can go up and then come back down the next morning it's completely changed and I really like that sort of balance that play of the hands on hands off mm -hmm. and it's the same by having that sort of organic the way that I paint is very orga organic it's very intuitive I don't know what a painting's going to look like but, but, um, when I start painting and um, I think putting the square around the edges is my way of saying okay that's the edge it's got all this energy and it's connected but that's the edge I'd like to hear a little bit about this making of sense within your work. So it seems as though you are using painting as a means to communicate the incommunicable. Yeah. And so the symbolism of a frame is very much that kind of idea, the idea of 
framing something and, and closing off and almost putting a full stop on something just to, to make sense of it and to say that there is an ending to it. Yeah. I'm interested in hearing about what you're looking to do next. Seeing this, as, is this the end of a series or moving on to different no, types I of work? I think that my work is never an end. You know, a lot of people paint a picture and then that picture's finished and then they move on to the next one. I don't work like that. You know, there's, there's paintings that I've got at home in my studio space that have probably been in there for 10 years and I am constantly having a dialogue with the surface of those paintings so it never stops and although my ideas might change or I get, I get influenced by something that I've read or, you know, something that somebody just says to me in passing can change the way that I work but it, I, it's, there's never a full stop and I think as an artist, my, personally as an artist, you know, I think if I just think, okay, that's it, that painting's finished and I'm happy with that painting, then maybe that's time for me to stop painting. You know, it's difficult. Although, you know, this, obviously it's like reading a book, isn't it? It's like we've got various chapters of a book. You know, each painting is probably like a chapter. You know, it has to, it moves on and it, and it has to, it, it sort of evolves and grows in that way. The way that you talk about painting, it, there are so many links to literature. And, and I hate writing about my work, which is, which is quite strange. Although I do read, you know, I do read quite a lot. Um, and I'm constantly listening to audiobooks in my studio. I, I, don't, I very rarely listen to music in my space. Um, and things that I re- listen to on, my, on my, some sentences in, in poems or bits of fiction that I take and I write down and they become part, they become part of the work. It's a sort of conscious sort of um, infiltration mm-hmm. and things like that. But um, I wish I could write more about my work, which is why I capitalise it on like, the big words because I, I can't explain it in any other way. Putting yourself into the position of someone coming into this space then, drawing it back into where we are right now, Aurel Mervyn at your, at your exhibition, Breathe. So why abstraction? If you're trying, if there is an attempt to communicate through something that is not figurative. Yeah, but I don't, I'm not interested in, I'm not interested in the photographic representation of the space. You know, that, you know, and also, you know, we live in a society that is so bombarded now visually. You know, you know, you can get five thousand photographs of the of the glacier that I saw, but of the five thousand photographs that you see online, one person probably took that photograph, so one person's actually experienced that 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 sort of that being in that landscape. And I and I my painting, it, it, I wouldn't, you know, I used to paint landscapes. You know, when I first moved to Wales in 1997. Um, I used to paint quite large scale landscapes, quite Turner-esque, and the light was the, you know, the, with the light playing in the sea and things like that. But it, I just got bored of that. I just felt that it was, it wasn't, it, well, I wasn't being truthful about it. And I think abstraction is difficult. You know, some people don't get it um, and they don't understand it. Some people prefer to look at things that they can understand, and that it's quite. I'm not saying that landscape painting, of course, is, is just about the surface, because it's not. It, it still appreciates beauty and nature. But for me, um, I, I want to have more of a challenging experience than I've at work. This sincerity and this truthfulness to yourself, I'd like to ask about how much of yourself is important within this work? How much of Helen Booth is within these paintings? Everything. Yeah, everything. I think I try. No, I think for me to say that I'm like 10% of it is just bollocks, isn't it? I mean, it's it's got to be the whole thing. That's why would you bother? I'd like to talk about some specific works now. Okay. We've been speaking about these really large themes that I think are interesting, especially in relation to abstraction and about the practice of art and painting in general. The thing that I'd like to start off with are these really graphic black and white pieces, the one that's to the side of you right now, so starting off with Black Tide. You have managed to keep your the gestural swoops and the gestural string um, motifs, these swooping waves, mm-hmm. but they're they're more textural and less pattern pattern. There's, yeah. there's less order to them. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about these pieces? Uh, there's a very um, beautiful beach on the on the south coast of Iceland, um, Vik. It's called just B I K, and. Um, the sand there is the blackest sand I've ever seen in my life. And the sea is quite strange. The sea doesn't crash like it would crash onto the shores here in Wales. It sort of stands up and then it just disappears. But what happens is, as the, as the water sort of hits the ground, it 
causes this sort of seismic activity in the, in the, on the sand. So the sand just sort of takes the, almost like the shock wave of the sea without actually being covered in water. And the, the piece here, Black, um, Black Tide, is really about that. It's about the fact that all this activity is going on. It doesn't actually hit it, but there's these incredible formations and these lines that form within the sand. So that's where the initial idea for the piece came from. So would you say that these pieces, all of them in this space, are to do with the motions and movements of nature? These ever-present, constantly moving, ever yeah, flowing? Yeah, so. it's like a cyclical. I'm definitely interested in cycles and you know, the moon and the, the, the movement of the sea and the tides and things like that. It sort of plays on the big scale as well, doesn't it? So. I'm looking on the, the curation of this space, you've, you've got very clearly, I would say, a conversation going on between two tones. So you've got on one side these dark pieces and then the other side you've got the light, which I think makes sense in relation to your other work and that's something that you've always been thinking about. But moving forward now onto these four, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about these? Um, well, these are called A Certain Slant of Winter Light. Um, and the actual the titles came from an Emily, Dick, Emily Dickinson poem called um, A Certain Slant of Light. And I really like that idea of, of a certain slant. Sometimes you see things that you know when you, you're sort of lying in bed and, and the light comes through the window and you see all these tiny little dust particles floating around and if the light hadn't hit at that certain time you wouldn't see that. And it's exactly the same for these pieces here because the weather was so appalling in Iceland most of the time. Um, when the sun actually managed to break through this sort of haze that sort of covered the environment, you did see these incredible, sort of beautiful, amorphic, sort of white shapes, snow shapes sort of going through the light. And that's um, initially where these pieces came from. I would like to think about your, your change in method with these paintings that is this is new for you, raw canvas, this is very new for you, yeah. something that has only occurred in the last year. Yeah. You usually build up almost sometimes hundreds of layers on your painting yeah. and they build up through time, a, a, a long process. These, yeah. these paintings usually take a long time with a started base layer and you've avoided that this time. Yeah. Why? Uh, I just think that... Um, I just wanted to, because Iceland is so black and white, it is. I mean, I went in the, in the winter, so all I saw was black sand and white. So sometimes you saw a tiny bit of, sort of the same sort of colour as the canvas, a bit of moss underneath the snow and, and the ice, the black ice. But um, I just felt that the, the work needed to be on something that was its purest form, because the ideas that I were having, were, um, I was trying to sort of get that sort of, the idea of purity and, and the, the idea of the sublime and, and, the, the, and beauty over and I, think, and I think using something in its raw form um, allowed me to sort of play a bit more with the marks. If I, when I normally paint, I normally paint my, my canvases in either a white ground or a black ground. Sometimes I use gesso because I love the chalky feel of gesso, but there's always some kind of colour there. So if I have a white ground and I'm painting with a white paint, there's, there's the sort of depth that I've got between those two tones is so shallow that it won't allow me to, to sort of explore the idea of the mark. And by using raw canvas, although it's very pale and it's natural in, in tone, whites take on a whole new energy. They take on this incredible um, vibrancy. But also, when you look really closely at the raw canvas, there's these tiny sort of impurities of, of sort of dark brown and black flecks in it. And when you get really close, you can, you can actually see those. And I love the scale, the paleo scale, the tiny little black dot on them, and the big white dot. But you have to look really closely to, to see that. Your relationship to your practice is very insular, independent. You're in your studio alone for hours. Yeah. You work with these paintings for months, sometimes years. There's a really important intimacy there within the work. And to be exhibiting in a space that's so close to your studio, and to have to, pre to be presenting an opportunity for people to come and visit these works on their own within a space. I think that despite the negative sides of COVID, of course, it's exciting to have this new format of an exhibition space to be amongst such expressive, immersive, rich works. I'm excited to hear how people react to it. I think that it's a brilliant show and I think that it's a brilliant start to 2021.